Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Welcome to our new show, Reality Asserts Itself. The writer Chris Hedges talking about the Reverend Daniel Berrigan life he says we should emulate, wrote this. Berrigan is one of the nation's most courageous voices for justice. And then quoting Berrigan, Hedges writes, Faith always starts with oneself. It means an overriding sense of responsibility for the universe, making sure that the universe is left in good hands, and the belief that things will finally turn out right if we remain faithful. Now joining us in Baltimore is Chris Hedges. Thanks for joining us again. Sure. So watch part one and part two. You'll see the introduction down below is the full introduction of Chris. But by now, everybody knows Chris is a great writer. He wrote for the New York Times for 15 years, and now he writes for Truth Day. So, if we remain faithful, it will turn out all right. Do you still have that faith? Do you still believe that? In an existential sense, yes. In a practical sense, perhaps not. Um, we are emulating, as anthropologists like Tainter or Redmond or others have chronicled and collapse of past civilizations, all of the mistakes that um, complex societies have made uh, over the centuries, uh, 5,000 years of human civilization. And um, uh, the difference is that this time when our civilization goes down, the whole planet's going to go down with us. Uh, the folly of allowing the fossil fuel industry to determine our relationship to the ecosystem uh, the folly of embracing an ideology of limitless expansion and consumption. Uh, you know, at this point, it's quite clear what the consequences of that will be, and yet we cannot wrest ourselves from uh, these systems or from uh, the uh, benefits that those of us in the wealthy industrialized world derive from these systems. Um, uh, and I think that Berrigan uh, certainly sees all of that. Uh, and yet uh, he makes that leap, which I also make, from the practical to the moral. Uh, and as Father Berrigan says, we're called to do the good, or at least the good insofar as we can determine it, and then we have to let it go. That the Buddhists call it karma, that for us it's the belief that the good draws to it the good that rebellion and resistance itself is a moral imperative. And even though uh, empirically uh, everything around us may uh, appear to deteriorate, it doesn't invalidate that act of resistance. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, I read the climate science reports, uh, including one not long ago by the World Bank, which is pretty uh, apocalyptic. Uh, I have... Uh, I think, uh, you know, especially looking at how past societies and past civilizations have crumbled. I was I studied classics at Harvard. Um, uh, you know, you can look at the fall of the Roman Empire, or the Mesopotamian Empire, or the uh, Mayan Empire. Um, at the end, uh, your elites retreat into uh, self-protected enclaves, forbidden cities, Versailles, as just as our elite has utterly unplugged itself from day-to-day -day reality. I think a New Yorker writer called it Richistan. They don't fly commercial airlines. They, there's one set of laws and regulations for the 99% and a whole another set of laws and regulations with their lobbyist right uh, for themselves. Um, they live in a kind of parallel universe. They don't understand, and yet they are the ones who are uh, relentlessly uh, exploiting uh, both human capital and finally the environment uh, for short-term profit. I mean, 40% of the summer Arctic sea ice melts and Shell Oil looks at it as a business opportunity. We're talking about the death throes of the planet uh, and they're dropping one half billion dollar drill bit after another. Uh, there's a scramble for the last vestiges of fish stocks, uh, oil, gas, minerals, it's, it's utter insanity. I wrote a column last week that said, you know, it, Melville's the most prescient um, sort of oracle in, a, in American culture because we're all on the Pequot. We're all headed off on this insane quest, uh, which, uh, which I think in rational moments we even understand will kill us. And yet we can't free ourselves from it. Here's what Chris wrote. 
And so we plunge forward in our doomed quest to master the forces that will finally smite us. Those who see where we are going lack the fortitude to rebel. Mutiny was the only salvation for the Pequod's crew. It's our only salvation, but moral cowardice turns us into hostages. Moby Dick rams and sinks the Pequod. The waves swallow up Ahab and all who follow him, except one. A vortex formed by the ship's descent collapses, and quote, and the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled 5,000 years ago. It's pretty gloomy, the outlook of some people have critiqued some of your writing, especially more recently, that it's kind of gloomy, that, that people are left feeling like the sea is going to sort of overtake us and there isn't much we could do. Uh, just one more thing. In the same article about Berrigan, you wrote, the failure by large numbers of citizens to carry out mass acts of civil disobedience will only ensure that we remain hostages to corporate power. You're disappointed in not seeing more civil disobedience. You're because the what? formal mechanisms of power don't work. We've undergone what John Ralston Saul calls correctly a coup d'etat, corporate coup d'etat in slow motion, and it's over. They've won. We live in what the political philosopher Sheldon Wolin calls a system of inverted totalitarianism. And by that he means it's not classical totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of the corporate state. That in classical totalitarian regimes, you have a reactionary or revolutionary party that replaces one structure with another. In inverted totalitarianism, you have corporate forces that purport to, uh, to be loyal to the Constitution, electoral politics, the iconography and language of American patriotism, and yet internally have seized all of the levers of power to render the citizen impotent. And, um, and so that this political theater, which we are witnessing, is a charade. Um, the Democrats are as beholden to corporate power as the Republicans. Uh, the judiciary has become a wholly owned subsidiary of the corporate state. Uh, and our only hope left is to build mass movements of dissent, and I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe, uh, that can wrest power back from this rapacious corporate elite that quite literally will kill us. And I, I see of course it's bleak, um, and you know, I'm sorry, the, 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 the climate science reports are bleak. Uh, I'm not making it up. Uh, and uh, this kind of mania for hope uh, is really uh, a kind of sickness because it prevents us from seeing how dire and catastrophic the situation is if we don't radically reconfigure our relationship to each other and to the ecosystem. Uh, and so, of course people don't want to hear it. You know, they want to uh, become uh, entranced or mesmerized with the trivia that dominates the airwaves and the sagas and soap operas. And, uh, you know, we are fed this mantra that is really fiction. And, and the mantra goes that we can have everything we want, that reality is never an impediment to what we desire, and that's given to us by Oprah, and it's given us to us by Hollywood that's why and the we're Christian. We're calling right? this show "Reality well, Asserts Itself" because you can think that, right? But. And and it's just it's a lie. It's not true. Uh, and and I think we can't even use the word hope uh, until we confront reality and begin to resist against the real. If we're resisting against uh, a fantasy or fiction if we believe that Barack Obama is going to save us, um, then, you know, it's like writing letters to Uncle Joe Stalin if he only knew what they were doing here out in, you know, the Ukrainian wheat fields, uh, where, of course, millions of people died for the famine. Then uh, everything we do is futile. So I think uh, it's fundamental that we grasp reality in order to build effective resistance. And unfortunately, reality at this moment in human history is, is uh, pretty bleak. Well, that's, let's pick that up in the, in the next segment. So please join us in the next part of the series of interview with Chris Hedges on reality asserts itself on The Real News Network.
Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Welcome to our new show, Reality Asserts Itself. Now joining us in Baltimore is Chris Hedges. Thanks for joining us again. Sure. So watch part one and part two. You'll see the introduction down below is the full introduction of Chris. But by now, everybody knows Chris is a great writer. He wrote for The New York Times for 15 years, and now he writes for Truth Dig. So how much of the, this lack of mass movement Although we, I, you know, we need to say there is one. There are things happening all over the country and certainly all over the world. I mean, in some places, from Brazil to e Egypt, surprising things are happening. Right. Uh, it's complicated, but things are happening. Right. Uh, on the other hand, we're not seeing this kind of even Brazilian-style mass movement here, and, and certainly not a, a wide-scale civil disobedience movement. But how much is that the responsibility, weakness, if you want, fault of the American left? In 2008, in, in a piece you wrote, Why Am I a Socialist?, you wrote this. The inability to articulate a viable socialism has been our gravest mistake. Do you still believe that? Yes, because we have allowed ourselves uh, to embrace an ideology which, at its core, states that all governance is about maximizing corporate profit at the expense of the citizenry. For what do we have? structures of government? For what do we have uh, institutions uh, of state if not to hold up all the citizenry and especially the most vulnerable? Uh, you know, if you go back and look at the 1980s in especially the Scandinavian countries, they eradicated poverty virtually. Uh, I lived in Switzerland. I studied French in Switzerland. And uh, there were no homeless. Uh, the mentally ill were taken care of. Uh, it has arguably one of the best healthcare systems in the world. My oldest son was born in Lausanne. Uh, and that was, uh, it's actually a privatized system, but it's heavily regulated. Everybody pays into it, but everybody has health insurance. Uh, senior public school teachers earned about as much as doctors. And um, with the wealth given to us as Americans, we could have eradicated poverty. We could have created a country that was much different. Uh, than what we have created. Uh, and, and, and what's happening now is that we are being rapidly reconfigured into a kind of neo-feudal society, an oligarchic society where uh, increasingly the bottom two-thirds of Americans are hanging on by their fingertips. You have a shrinking, diminishing middle class and an elite that is just making obscene amounts of money uh, at our expense. Uh, and you can't sustain First of all, you can't sustain a democracy and an oligarchy. That's not a new idea. Thucydides wrote about that, about ancient Athens. Um, but secondly, uh, because there are no self-imposed limits, and in this sense, Karl Marx was right, that unfettered, unregulated capitalism, especially on a global scale, is a revolutionary force. Um, they will push and push and push until there is a backlash. And I think part of what we're seeing with the security and surveillance state is a preparation for that backlash. The destruction of civil liberties, uh, which has been brutal. Uh, the wholesale surveillance and monitoring of you know, virtually every American citizen, which, Edward, which I think many of us suspected, and Edward Snowden, uh, through his disclosures to Glenn Greenwald of The Guardian, made uh, you know, palpably real. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, and I sued the president in uh, the Southern District Court of New York, and, and I won, where now he, the Obama administration has appealed it. But this permits uh, the military to seize, arrest American citizens, strip them of due process, and hold them in, in uh, military detention centers, including our offshore penal colonies in places like Guantanamo or Bagram. And when Judge Catherine Forrest wrote her 112-page opinion, which I think is worth reading, uh, she actually brings up the plight of the 110,000 Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II and stripped of due process and said that this provision in the NDAA uh, essentially allows the state to criminalize an entire group of people and lock them away uh, without any legal redress. Uh, and they know what's coming. The NSA and has run all sorts of scenarios on economic collapse and especially climate change. Uh, and they're preparing. Hey, let me add one thing to that. We, we did this in our coverage of the G20 uh, protests in Toronto where 1,000 people were arrested. Right. But I think there's pretty clear evidence that when they arrest 1,000 people in Toronto, when there's very little happening, right. this is dress rehearsal. This is training for, for how, do, how do you do right. mass arrests. And it's also a message to everyone else. Um, 
uh, I mean, let's remember that whatever the internal faults of the Occupy movement, and they were there, the Occupy movement was destroyed. And I was just uh, at a trial in New York, Veterans for Peace, 25 people arrested. I was there in October 7th uh, at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Plaza in New York, which technically closes at 10, but isn't, that's never enforced unless you're carrying out a public demonstration, uh, uh, that, that there is now a decision uh, by the security and surveillance state to essentially uh, seize uh, all public space, to make any kind of protests within public space impossible because they don't want to see generated another Occupy movement. And indeed, when many of these vets were arrested, the cops were telling them, look, we're vets, we don't want to arrest you, but the Occupy movement messed it up for you because we can't allow another one. Uh, the state was quite rattled by the Occupy movement uh, and is determined not to allow a movement, a mass movement like that, uh, to rise up again. And yet, uh, you know, you read Paul Krugman's columns in the New York Times, where he constantly calls for a rational response to the economic crisis. Um, uh, and a rational response would be a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions, a forgiveness of student debt, a massive jobs program, rebuilding infrastructure, especially targeted people under the age of 25. That would be rational. But the state doesn't respond rationally uh, because uh, the, the, there are no mechanisms, counter mechanisms now to make piecemeal or incremental reform possible, which was the role of the traditional liberal class. And I spend a long time in the death of the liberal class laying this out. Um, uh, and so they keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, you're seeing uh, unemployment benefits being taken away. You're seeing Head Start programs being shut down. You're seeing an assault on public education. Um, uh, you're, you, the, the Congress can't even uh, keep cap the student debt at 3%. It's now risen to 6%, while at the same time the Fed is lending trillions of dollars to corporations like Goldman Sachs at virtually 0% interest. And then these financial uh, corporations, uh, especially if you're laid on your credit card, uh, are charging us uh, upwards to 30%. Um, I don't know what that is. It's not capitalism. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, extortion. Uh, and that's the system that we live under. So because there are no self-imposed limits, um, there will be a response. Uh, it may not look like Occupy. It may not call itself Occupy. Indeed, I don't think that it will. Um, but I, I've covered movements all over the world. I covered uh, the, the revolutions in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania. I covered uh, the, both of the Palestinian uprisings or intifadas. I covered the street demonstrations that brought down Milosevic. And you know as a reporter that the tinder is there. So having spent two years uh, writing Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt out of the very poorest pockets of the country with Joe Sacco, uh, and having been, you know, in cities like Camden, which per capita is the poorest city in the United States and not surprisingly the most dangerous, something's coming. What will trigger it? It will be benign. It will be uh, a seemingly innocuous event. In Brazil, it was bus fares. There you go. In, in the first Palestinian uprising, it was a traffic accident. Um, uh, but something, something's coming. Now, I should add that in American society, we have a long tradition of extremist, vigilante, right-wing violence, which can be categorized as fascist, uh, where you uh, fuse the uh, language and iconography of the state with the Christian religion, where you demonize the vulnerable, uh, Muslims, undocumented workers, uh, homosexuals, intellectuals, liberals, feminists, they have a long list of people they hate. Uh, and those are powerful forces within American society. Uh, the left has been destroyed, especially the radical left, quite consciously in the whole name of anti-communism and uh, the death of the liberal class really explains the destruction of those movements. But those movements were important because, as Howard Zinn points out in the People's History of the United States, we, they opened up the democratic space, that, we, that the, the people who founded this country were slave-holding white male oligarchs. Uh, who were terrified, and you can see it in the Federalist Papers, of any kind of popular democracy. Uh, and so that all of the advances within American society and, 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 you know, within the industrialized world, we had the bloodiest, deadliest labor wars of any country. Hundreds of workers were killed. Thousands were wounded. Uh, the violence was quite brutal and quite extreme. Uh, and so you saw with 
the abolitionists, with the labor movement, with the suffragists, if, even with the civil rights movement, movements outside the power structure, condemned as radical, that forced a liberal elite to respond and open up space. Now the radical movements are gone and destroyed, and more importantly, the liberal institutions have been disemboweled uh, to serve corporate interests. So it, what the result is that we as citizens have, through the traditional structures of power, been left powerless to respond. The only hope left is to get out in the street and build the kind of mass movements that I saw in countries like East Germany, where you had half a million people showing up in Alexanderplatz in East Berlin, or half a million people showing up in the streets of Prague and in Wenceslas Square during the Velvet Revolution, which I also covered. I'm not even, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not naive enough to tell you it's gonna work. Um, uh, but uh, appealing to the better nature of the Democratic Party, I can assure you, is not going to work. But doesn't this mass movement need some kind of electoral strategy? Otherwise, you wind up in a situation, don't you, like what happened in Egypt, where Mubarak falls, but there is no electoral strategy of, of the left in any place, so it's the Muslim Brotherhood. No, I've, that covered, I've covered totalitarian states all over the world, and they all have elections. Um, no, I didn't say, I said, doesn't it need an electoral strategy? I'm not sure that it does. Um, I think that the problem is, you know, and Karl Popper writes this in The Open Society and its Enemies, he said, the question is not how do you get good people to rule. Um, Popper says that's the wrong question. Most people, Popper writes, attracted to power are at best mediocre, which is Obama, or venal, which is Bush. The question is how do you make the power elite frightened of you? Who was the last liberal president we had? It was Richard Nixon, not because he was a liberal, but because he was frightened of movements. And there's a scene, I think it's in Kissinger's memoirs, 1971, huge anti-war demonstration surrounding the White House. And Nixon has put empty buses, city buses, end to end as a kind of barricade. And he's standing at the window, wringing his hands, going, Henry, they're gonna break through the barricades and get us. And that's just where you want power, people in power to be. And, and, and that's why Sarkozy, who was a Cretan, was unable to do too much damage to France. Because um, if you got up in France and told French university students that they were gonna pay $50,000 a year to go to college, they shut the damn country down. And we have to recognize that for those of us who care about defending the rights of the underclass, we have to hold fast to the moral imperatives of movements and force power to respond to those movements. If we integrate those movements into the power structure, we, if we, in essence, compromise the integrity of those movements, we diminish their power. And that goes back to Julian Benda, the, his great work, The Treason of Intellectuals, where he says, all of us have the option of serving two sets of principles, privilege and power or justice and truth. But for those of us who care about privilege and power, the more we make concessions to those who serve privilege and power, for those of us who care about justice and truth, the more we diminish the capacity for justice and truth. The point is to make, build organizations that make the power elite frightened of us. And if we uh, uh, invest our energy, as I think the left unfortunately has, into uh, political parties, uh, uh, or at least, let's say, the Democratic Party. And I, you know, I wrote uh, Nader's major policy speeches for him in 2008 and voted for Gene Stein in the last election, but as a kind of protest vote. Um, then uh, all of the programs that I think we so desperately need in a democratic state are going to be destroyed. I mean, Roosevelt was a compromise figure. You had the Communist Party, you had the Progressive Party, you had anarcho-syndicalist unions like the Wobblies. You had a radical left that was putting pressure. So Roosevelt says that his greatest achievement is that he saved capitalism, and he's right. And, uh, and most of the policies that he adopted, he took from the left. But to go back to what you wrote, the inability to articulate a viable socialism has been our gravest mistake. In the 30s, there was a movement, for better or worse, that had a vision of something to fight for. It wasn't just to fight against. It well, wasn't that, just a holding That's operation. what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we have to hold, you, you, you have to hold fast to that moral imperative. So uh, if you keep 
uh, conceding. I mean, let's look at what the liberal class has conceded to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party in Europe would be a far-right party. Uh, it's pro-war, it's anti-union, uh, it's anti-civil liberties. I mean, Ob Obama's assault on civil liberties is worse than Bush. It's an enemy of the press. It's used the Espionage Act to shut down whistleblowers, which are the lifeblood of a free press. It has assassinated American citizens. I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, at what point do you say enough? And I think that uh, Nader uh, was correct in, when he ran for president by saying, if we can get 5, 10, 15 million people to withdraw from the system as a kind of counterweight, we can begin to put pressure from the other side. But right now, there is no pressure from the other side because we are effectively manipulated. Look, both sides of the political spectrum are manipulated by the same forces. If you're uh, some right-wing Christian zealot in Georgia, uh, then it's homosexuals and abortion and all these you know, wedge issues that are used to whip you up emotionally. If you are a liberal in Manhattan, it's, uh, uh, you know, they'll all be teaching creationism in your schools or whatever. Um, yet, in fact, it's just a game because uh, whether it's Bush or whether it's Obama, a Goldman Sachs wins, always. There is no way to vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs. And it's only by stepping outside the system uh, and challenging the system, and we can do that through electoral politics, which is what Debs did, 1912, I think he pulled 6% of the vote. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we'll take power. It just means that we will begin to build forces that will pressure power to respond. And I think that's what we've forgotten. Um, we have to begin to make the power elite really terrified of us. And Occupy did that, by the way. They were terrified of Occupy. And you saw in the election... Because they thought it would really catch on. Well, it was bigger the, than it was. and they had to destroy it. And let's remember who destroyed it. Barack Obama destroyed it in a coordinated federal campaign because the people who were most threatened by Occupy were the Democrats, which is why they tried to co-opt the language and they sent out Van Jones, you know, Occupy, the ballot booth, and all this kind of stuff. In the same way, they were threatened by Nader, 2000. They were terrified of Nader, which is Nader's uh, mortal enemy became the Democratic Party, challenging all his voter lists, which, of course, made him spend millions in legal fees to fight back, uh, demonizing him for the uh, election of Bush, when in fact Bush was appointed by fiat by the Supreme Court. It had nothing to do with Nader. They didn't do the recount in Florida because Gord won. Um, uh, so uh, what I'm saying is that um, you, you can have an electoral strategy, uh, but an electoral strategy is uh, not going to include embracing the Democratic Party. Well, that's, let's pick that up in the, in the next segment. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not yet saying what I think the strategy is. I'm just saying if there okay. isn't one right. that's in some way or form, then you're never talking about po taking power. At best, you're talking about a defensive operation and putting pressure what? on those who have power. Right. But hold on. Okay. All right. We're going to do this in the next Okay. So please join us in the next part of this series of interview with Chris Hedges on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.